This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abadamarco with the Neurology Podcast, and today we're continuing our series on all things related to autoimmune encephalitis. Our last episode focused on antibody testing, but as we know, those results take time to return. And given their complexity, we need a systematic way to think through these cases, especially when we're considering initiation of immunotherapies. So today, we have two for the price of one, as we're joined by Owen Flanagan and Grace Gombele to help expand the differential when we're considering a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. Owen is a professor of neurology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and has joined us many times in the podcast before with his last interview on December 22nd. 2022, Autoimmune Encephalitis Misdiagnosis in Adults, which really touches on some themes that we're going to discuss today. But if you haven't listened to that episode, please check it out. Grace is a pediatric neurologist at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and an assistant professor at Emory University School of Medicine. And while this series has definitely been focused on adults, Grace is really going to help provide that pediatric lens to think about these cases. So thanks to both of you for joining. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Maybe we start with the clinical history, then talk about testing. What are some key elements that you think of when you're considering a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis? When I am seeing a child who is coming in for suspected autoimmune encephalitis, I do find that the clinical history is really important to making this diagnosis. And what I will do is I will actually start from the beginning. I will start with the birth history. Oftentimes, patients, families will focus on a sentinel event, be an infection, some other event that happened, and then they notice symptoms after that. But I think it's really important to highlight there could have been other things that were happening prior to the sentinel event. If you have the time and are able to, I also try to get a history from the teachers, uh, the teachers who knew the child in the year or two prior to the onset, just to get a sense of were there symptoms happening at school that the parents were unaware of. So that focus on their baseline neurocognitive function and to see really where things were changed or has this been more of a chronic issue? Right, exactly. When you think of autoimmune encephalitis, what are you trying to look for in terms of timeline when you compare it to be a developmental disorder? So with autoimmune encephalitis, it tends to be a more rapid onset, meaning that you'll start having symptoms or the child will start having symptoms within the past few months. Oh, and when you're thinking about this, what are some key elements outside of that temporal cadence of symptoms? Some other things we sometimes ask about is seizures, if they've been having epileptic seizures. A lot of times, autoimmune encephalitis patients will have seizures, sometimes looking out for facio-brachial dystonic type seizures and asking about that. Are they dropping things from their hand? Is their face twitching? Are they having any other movement disorders? Because sometimes they can associate with autoimmune encephalitis. And then, you know, I generally go through the full history, past medical history. Is there a long history of psychiatric disease, for example, that might might suggest that this is just an exacerbation of a chronic type condition. Is there a history of cancer that might suggest that this is a perineoplastic condition? For example, small cell lung cancer we know commonly associates with perineoplastic type um, encephalitis. I look through the medications looking to see is there medications that could explain the patient's cognitive dysfunction. Sometimes patients will come into us who are on multiple medications that could be interfering with cognition, opioid medications, topiramates, another one that can cause cognitive issues. So I generally go over some of that. And then, you know, in the family history, looking, is there a family history of autoimmunity or is there a personal history in the past of autoimmunity can be useful to look for too. So I look for some of these to both look for factors that might suggest autoimmune encephalitis and also factors that might argue against autoimmune encephalitis and a different reason for encephalopathy. What are some key elements within the MRI or CSF testing? I'm thinking about my differential diagnosis. So in a patient with, for example, a rapidly progressive dementia, I would be looking carefully at the diffusion-weighted images to see if there's any cortical ribboning or deep gray matter restricted diffusion that might suggest a prion disorder like CJD. I'm also looking for changes that might suggest an autoimmune encephalitis, like inflammation within the mesial temporal lobes. Sometimes inflammation that extends outside of the mesial temporal lobes might suggest herpes simplex encephalitis. So I'm looking for some of those signal abnormalities that extend into the entire temporal lobe and up towards the insula. 
And then we'll look for other patterns that might suggest, for example, MOG antibody associated disease, which can have multifocal MRI changes uh, within the white matter that can be recognizable in the setting of an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or an ADEM type presentation. And then we'll look at other sequences. We'll look at the post-gadolinium images to see is there gadolinium enhancement, as that's often a marker of inflammation. Also, the blood sequences, looking at SWI and GRE, as seeing blood products on the MRI is unusual for autoimmune encephalitis and might suggest a different etiology, such as uh, vasculitis or some other vasculopathy. Uh, So there are some of the things that I, I do in my baseline screening, looking at the MRI. And then in terms of the spinal fluid, I suppose we're always looking for an elevated white blood cell count. I always look also at the red blood cell count because sometimes if it's a traumatic tap, that can lead to an increase in white blood cells. Um, And then we look at uh, markers like oligoclonal bands. As Some patients with autoimmune encephalitis will have elevated oligoclonal bands suggesting uh, inflammation in the spinal fluid. And then I think we can use our spinal fluid to look for our differential diagnosis. We talked about CJD. We can send off for the RT quick testing for prion proteins. We can also use the CSF to assess for cancer cells, malignant cells, as sometimes lymphomas can mimic autoimmune encephalitis. We can look for Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. And then, of course, we're going to be doing antibody testing. And those results, as we said, can take a while to come back. But I think some of the other tests can come back quickly. And of course, our infectious testing, herpes simplex virus type 1, for example, and other infectious testing, depending on the time of year, we may consider uh, within the spinal fluid also. And I think if the spinal fluid shows that it's bland or that there's no evidence of inflammation, you should at least stop and think, reassess, could this be a non-inflammatory or different etiology and not an autoimmune encephalitis? There are some exceptions. For example, IGLON-5, LGI-1 antibodies, and sometimes AMPA receptor antibodies, for example, can have a completely normal CSF and a normal MRI and still have autoimmune encephalitis. But usually there's clues clinically there. These patients usually present with a subacute or rapidly progressive condition. So the clinical clues can be there to help you in the setting of, of the MRI being normal or the CSF being normal. I think that focus on trying to identify those objective markers for neuroinflammation is super helpful. Grace, what are your thoughts? I agree with what Owen just said. This is pretty similar to what we would think about in children. In terms of additional imaging findings I might consider, you really want to see if it's symmetric pattern of something going on or not. So for example, if there's more basal ganglia involvement and it's symmetric, plus or minus diffusion restriction, you might think about a mitochondrial disorder happening. If there's extensive white matter involvement, but again, it's pretty symmetric, um, thinking about some of the leukogystrophies. And Grace, I wanted to build off of that one point you made about the genetic piece. How do you approach genetic testing in your practice? It can be hard to implement, especially in the acute setting. But we've had many conversations on the podcast where we've seen genetic disorders masquerading as neuroinflammatory disorders. So do you have any pearls or thoughts on how you deal with that on the inpatient, outpatient side? Yes, it also depends on your institution and what they're able to cover or they're willing to send out. When I think about genetic testing in these cases, first you have to think about what types of genetic testing is out there. And then you also have to consider what your institution will allow you to send, both inpatient and outpatient, and what will be covered. So, for example, the main genetic test that I will send will be chromosomal microarray, if you can get it, whole exome sequencing, or mitochondrial DNA sequencing, and I'll talk about the differences between those. Oftentimes, what I will start with is a chromosomal microarray, especially in a child with developmental problems. There's any evidence for regression. And the way that the chromosomal microarray works is that it looks for large um, changes in the DNA. So are large pieces that are extra or duplicates or missing or deletions. And so I think it's really important to know what the chromosomal microarray covers because the other testing will provide additional answers that won't be covered in the chromosomal microarray. And then if you have a patient with concerns for autism, for example, up to 40% of those patients will have an abnormal chromosomal microarray. So I find that a pretty good screening test in the beginning. If you're able to get this covered, then whole exome is where I try to go to next if I can. Whole exome sequencing is only actually covers 1% of your DNA because 1% of your DNA are exons. So it actually does sequencing of the exons and then looks for 
um, any point mutations. And this is something that you would not pick up on a chromosome microarray. And then depending on how the whole exome is done, one thing to note is that whole exome cannot pick up on large lesions and duplications, which is why you need chromosomal microarray to complement that assessment. It's helpful to have multiple family members, so that way, whenever they assess for different variations in the genes, they can see, okay, this is a variation that we see that hasn't been reported with other individuals, but there are other individuals in the family with that same mutation. And so then they can mark that as less likely to be a pathogenic variant, for example. So oftentimes they'll need to do what's called a trio, where you have the patient and then both biological parents. If you can get a sibling involved, biological sibling, sometimes they'll sequence siblings also. And then if there's other systemic problems going on that might point to you to a more focused genetic test and in particular specific genetic panel. For example, if you have a patient with a suspected immunodeficiency who also has neurological symptoms, there is primary immunodeficiency panels that can be sent. But I think generally both cost and for diagnostic purposes, I try to send whole exome if possible. I'll tell you, I didn't know about that microarray piece with autism. It's really interesting, again, a nuance within the pediatric world, but understanding which tests you're sending and what they are and are not able to screen for is really helpful. Owen, what are your thoughts? I guess it shifts a little bit, right, in our adult populations. How do you think through genetic testing when you're seeing patients? I think it's probably going to be a little less common in adults to see that, but I do think of a couple of scenarios, particularly mitochondrial disorders like MELAS can present with swollen temporal lobes or occipital lobes that can mimic the inflammation that we see with autoimmune encephalitis, and they also are episodic, so sometimes they will improve on their own. And if you give immunotherapy at the same time, it can mimic an autoimmune encephalitis. So I do consider about some of those mitochondrial disorders. And like Grace mentioned about the different signal abnormalities within the basal ganglia may help you with that. One other condition and clinical pearl that was taught to me was the acute necrotizing encephalopathy that can be associated with fevers and an infectious trigger. And some of those can be recurrent, and it's associated with the RAN, BP2, R-A-N, BP2 mutation. And we can sometimes see those patients come in to our adult clinics, and they often have a very severe deep gray matter signal abnormalities and um, associated with a febrile illness. So that's another one to think about, probably more common again in pediatrics, but one that we've come across in our adult clinics as well. Moving along, how do you guys think or utilize immunotherapy trials in your patients? I think the quote comes from House of God that no one should die in the hospital without a consideration of steroids. It still rings true even in today's world, but responsiveness to steroids and by extension, I think IVIG can create some confusion and it can be hard to decide on how to interpret those results. I think you're exactly right that all of us neurologists will use high-dose steroid trial, like one gram of IV methylprednisolone once daily for five days in patients where we're not sure of the diagnosis and maybe the tests are not back, but we have ruled out many things initially and we want to give a trial of treatment. You know, sometimes it's good to try and get some objective biomarkers before you do that because steroids can be somewhat activating and patients can actually feel a little bit better on steroids just from the systemic effects rather than a particular neurologic effect. So oftentimes, if possible, we'll try and measure a cognitive test before we do the trial and then after and see if we can objectively show improvement because we have to be a little bit careful because some disorders, for example, we talked about the mitochondrial disorders in hospital delirium, for example, its natural history is to get better. And if you give steroids at the same time, those patients may get better. There's also conditions like lymphomas that will respond quite well to steroids. So we always have to keep some of those things in the back of our mind as we're moving forward. And then I think we just have to use our judgment and ensure that we're following up and seeing those patients back after they complete the immunotherapy trial and really assessing, was it a true improvement? And then by that time, a lot of your testing may have come back. What I think we have to be also careful with, because a short course of steroids is generally fairly safe. But when you move on to second and third line immunotherapy like rituximab, cyclophosphamide, you really even need to take more care that you're sure about the diagnosis.
analysis. And by that time, many of your antibody test results will be back and you should be able to assimilate all of the data and push towards, is it truly autoimmune encephalitis or not, before you make that decision to pull the trigger on some of those more serious medications that can have more serious complications. I love that point about the objective markers, right? It can be really hard to interpret retrospectively. And then making sure you collect all the necessary data as steroids or IVIG can kind of cloud that picture, whether it be lab data, biopsies, things like that. It's really important. Grace, how do you think about these trials in pediatrics? I think it's also challenging when you have a patient who's in the hospital who is acutely ill and you don't want to wait for these tests to come back. So I can sometimes understand why people are anxious or really excited to trial. But I agree that having objective measures is very helpful. Trying to get your lab testing, like you mentioned, Justin, especially getting your CSF studies before giving IVIG is helpful because IVIG can, as everyone knows, cause an aseptic meningitis and potentially affect those results. And then in addition to that, I also just like to try one thing at a time. Sometimes these patients come in, especially with new onset psychosis or new psychiatric symptoms, and we're doing multiple things at once, including starting psychiatric treatments. And so just to really make sure that we're not clouding the picture, I think doing one change at a time is most important because then if we're focused on results of those changes, then we have a better sense of what's actually making a difference. Do you notice that there are specific antibodies when they do return that cause some trouble or confusion? Oh, and maybe we could start with you and thoughts about antibodies that can be a little bit difficult to interpret. Yeah, I'll start out with thyroid peroxidase antibodies or TPO antibodies. You know, everyone's aware of the term Hashimoto's encephalopathy, but TPO antibodies are problematic because they're present in, you know, up to 20 to 30 percent of normal individuals, elderly individuals. So we know that a third of patients who come to our clinic may be positive for those antibodies, but a third of them don't have autoimmune encephalitis. So the antibodies themselves are not a good marker, and really the neural antibodies are going to be much better. The ones that Dr. Dalmau covered in the last podcast will be much more reliable, particularly the ones in CSF. So I think you have to be very careful with how much you read into TPO antibodies, including high titer. I've seen many high titer patients who do not have autoimmune encephalitis. So in general, I don't use that. I use more the things that we mentioned before, like the onset of symptoms, the MRI findings, the CSF, and the neural antibodies to make my decision. The other thing to mention is that some antibodies, when they're tested with older generation techniques like immunoblots or line blots, in isolation, when some of those neural antibodies are positive, they're quite prone to false positivity as well. So we can see a background rate in the general population. So we have to be careful with some of those older generation techniques. But I think many of the laboratories around the world have been trying to improve the techniques and now using more cell-based assay and immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence patterns to try try and really determine the antibodies that are truly predictive of autoimmune encephalitis. And I'll say that if antibodies are positive by both a cell-based assay and the tissue, that is even more specific for autoimmune encephalitis. So there are some of the challenges around some of the older generation tests, particularly the TPO antibodies, which I don't find very useful in my practice. Grace, anything unique in the pediatric world? I agree with what Owen said that some people will send TPO antibodies. I also find them not very useful in those cases. And then, you know, another commonly positive antibody that will come back and then people get excited about will be a very low positive serum positive GAD65 antibody. But if the CSF is negative, if there's no other signs and symptoms that are consistent with GAD65, so for example, stiff person syndrome, then I think it's less likely to be a GAD65 mediated process. I know sometimes the Cunningham panel comes up, especially in our younger cohort. How do you think through some of those test results? There was a study with an independent lab who tried to evaluate the sensitivity and specificity of the Cunningham panel. And while all of the patients diagnosed with pandas in that cohort tested positive on the Cunningham panel, about 80% of the healthy controls also tested positive, resulting in a pretty low specificity. I think that the data is challenging with using the Cunningham panel. 
You know, sometimes, like uh, Grace mentioned, the uh, titer can be helpful. For example, with GAD65, very, very high titers is what we usually see with neurologic disease, such as stiff person syndrome, but also MOG antibodies. The MOG antibody, MOG test is a little bit sticky. So sometimes we see low positive MOG antibodies in patients who have other conditions, while the high titers are very predictive of true MOGAD type presentation. So sometimes using those titer results can be helpful. And then one other thing is that if the results don't really make good sense, for example, if you have a positive NMDA receptor antibody in serum, but it's negative in spinal fluid, that's unusual. And you might want to consider whether that might be a false positive or a not clinically relevant result. So looking out for some of those things, and you can consider contacting a local neuroimmunologist for if you have questions about some of the antibody results. And a lot of the laboratories that offer testing do offer a service where you can discuss with the physician about some of those results if you have questions. So I think utilizing some of those services can help address some of those challenges because it's very hard to keep up with all of the antibodies that are coming out, and many of them have different specificities, and some of them are a little bit more problematic than others. So I think reach out to your local laboratory if you do have questions on some of these results too. Definitely. Always a friendly autoimmune neurologist around to help interpret. And I like that description, sticky, because it can really feel challenging when you get some of these results and are discordant. But looking back and trying to take a big picture at these cases is really helpful. Maybe we could end on any other red flag symptoms. Again, I would come back to that insidious onset. So many of the adult patients, older adult patients, our differential is a neurodegenerative type disorder, dementia versus a autoimmune encephalitis type picture. And I think that subacute onset is going to be really critical. And then again, remembering to look through that medication list as there are many patients out there who have kind of a brain fog type symptoms that are is not really typical of what we see with autoimmune encephalitis, but they may have that related to chronic underlying conditions like in the setting of chronic migraine, in the setting of multiple medication use, they can have that sensation of brain fog. And that's not really typical of what we think of with autoimmune encephalitis. So that can be sometimes a red flag and there may be explanations for the cognitive complaints that the patient has within that history taking. Yeah, I agree that in the pediatric world, the same thing of that insidious onset where symptoms present since near birth, because we know most autoimmune conditions don't affect children right as when they're born. And then just really seeing what the clinical course has been over time. If a patient has had mainly behavioral or psychiatric symptoms, and it's been many years without the other features such as seizures or a new onset movement disorder outside of tics, because tics are really common. So about 25% of children will have tics at any given time, especially in the preschool age. And so any new movement disorders outside of tics or speech changes, that sort of thing, if it's purely or mainly behavioral and psychiatric, and that's been going on for many years, I think that's going to less likely be from autoimmune encephalitis. Well, Grace, Owen, we really appreciate both of you joining us today. We have our final installment of the series with Martin Titular, where he'll be discussing the long-term management of autoimmune encephalitis cases, so please stay tuned. But thanks again to both of you. Glad to be here. Thanks so much. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.